harsh winter weather is making its mark in Ukraine. Muddy terrain and below zero temperatures have made any offensive operations extremely difficult. Still, Russia has been attacking in the Avdivka and Bakhmut sections of the battlefield and trying to break through towards Kupiansk in the first half of December. They have not gained much so far, but it is safe to say that Russia has regained the initiative and will mostly continue having it for the upcoming months, as Ukraine is suffering from supply shortages. Welcome to another update from the war in Ukraine. Let's start with the situation on the battlefield. Russia has been trying to capture the small town of Marienka since the start of the war. It has been contested for months and has been razed to the ground by non-stop battle. On December 1st, the Russian army managed a breakthrough in Marienka. The 103rd Regiment of the 150th Division announced the capture of this town, but it was later revealed that the Ukrainians are still hanging on on the very western outskirts of Marienka. At best, for the Ukrainians, the situation in this town is critical. The complete capture of Marienka would give the Russian army ground to attack Kurakova and create a potentially dangerous situation for Volodar due to supply issues. Control over Volodar would enable the Russians to restore a railroad line, reducing the transportation time of Russian units and increasing their mobility. Elsewhere around Bakhmut, Russia has continued regaining positions previously lost during the Ukrainian counteroffensive. On December 2nd, they recaptured Kromova on the northern flank. On December 5th, the Vostok battalion advanced towards Bordenivka. In the south, the Russians recaptured elevation 215.7 adjacent to Klishchivka, threatening Ukrainian positions in Klishchivka and Andreevka. The Russian army has also expanded its control area in and around Avdiivka. In this period, the Russians have reached the northern edge of the coke plant, occupied the Donetsk filter station to the east of Avdiivka, made progress south of the ash dump and southwest of Vesela, and gained further ground towards Novobatmativka and Novokalinova. The Russian progress is steady but slow, as the harsh winter conditions are not making it any easier to conduct challenging offensive operations. The US National Security Council reported that the Russians have lost 13,000 soldiers and 220 combat vehicles in the Avdivka sector, since battles restarted there a few months ago. We have seen visually verified confirmation of huge losses of equipment by Russia in Avdivka, especially in the first days of the battle, but it is impossible to verify the information about personnel losses. Russian forces continue attacking both in the Leman and Kupiansk sectors on the North Luhansk front, but their gains there have been extremely limited in the past several months. Ukraine's attempts on the Zaporizhia front, or in the Krinky bridgehead, have so far led to similarly limited results. The intensity of battles in the Robotina salient has somewhat decreased in the past several weeks, as the front line has barely moved there. In Krinky, Ukraine still controls some of this settlement and is fighting to expand its control over the forest area in the south, but so far the Russians have been able to hold them off without actually managing to destroy the Ukrainian bridgehead. The Russians have been actively targeting Ukrainian speedboats carrying reinforcements, but the Ukrainian units there in the bridgehead have managed to entrench their positions to some extent. Russian sources are worried that freezing small rivers on the Kherson front may make it easier to transfer troops and equipment to the left bank, but this possibility does not seem imminent. Ukrainian political and military leadership has recognized that they are on the defensive now and has ordered the construction of fortifications and defensive structures along the border with Russia and Belarus and on the battlefield. This includes anti-tank pyramids, which were earlier ridiculed by some analysts, but proved their effectiveness in combination with minefields and fortifications during the Ukrainian counter-offensive. The Russians have started regularly launching missiles and drones on Ukraine in this period. Almost every day, several Shahed drones and cruise or ballistic missiles attack Ukrainian infrastructure. The Ukrainian air defense is predictably unable to shoot down all drones and missiles, but so far we have not seen any major damage to the civilian infrastructure and particularly to the Ukrainian power grid. But it is just the start of winter, and at some point Russian air attacks may intensify. Ukraine tries to retaliate against these attacks as much as possible. On December 5th, Ukraine launched a drone attack on Russian military assets in Crimea. The Ukrainian media claimed that this attack damaged the marine oil terminal in Feodosia and several radar and air defense systems, while Russia refuted this, saying they had shot down all 35 Ukrainian drones. Both sides are also trying to hurt each other in non-military ways. In this period, Ukrainian hackers damaged the Russian tax system, 
while Russians disabled the Ukrainian mobile operator Kyivstar for a couple of days. The use of such asymmetric attacks to wear the adversary down will likely continue. Uninterrupted supply of the military remains a crucial aspect for any long war, and the one ongoing in Ukraine is no exception. On December 1st, the Deputy Defense Minister of Ukraine, Ivan Havrilik, stated that Ukraine had developed a new electromagnetic warfare system to counter Russian radar-guided weapons and drones, which has been successfully tested. If that is indeed the case, it would be a major step forward for Ukraine. Disabling the Russian capacity to use drones on the battlefield has been noted by the Commander-in-Chief Zelushny as one of the key components of the potential future success of the Ukrainian army in this war. Havrilyuk also noted that Ukraine is planning to increase domestic military production, particularly with regards to air defenses. Besides ramping up domestic production, Ukraine is also training new brigades for offensive and defensive operations, according to the Foreign Minister Kuliba. This video was sponsored by our kind YouTube members and patrons. Becoming a YouTube member or patron is the best way to support our work, so we're now providing our supporters with exclusive videos to thank them. Join their ranks to watch the Pacific War series, alongside the First Punic War, Sulla's biography, the Italian War of Unification, Risorgimento, the Russo-Japanese War, Albigensian Crusade, History of Prussia, and much more. 80 or so exclusive videos in total. In 2024, YouTube members and patrons will watch series on the Fall of Sparta, the Reconquista, Second Punic War, Spanish War of Succession, and Russian Civil War, and will continue getting early access to all videos, access to an exclusive Discord server, will know our schedule, and vote on future videos. YouTube member and patron support allows us to keep the majority of our videos free in a world where YouTube monetization income is very uneven. If you want to support our work, join their ranks today via the link in the description and pinned comment. Thank you! Ukraine is still very far from being militarily self-sufficient, and continues relying on its Western partners for military supplies. Unfortunately for them, the US Congress has failed to reach an agreement on funding Ukraine. Initially it seemed that the Congress would go to a recess, but the negotiations are ongoing. Right now, the US government is running out of funding for Ukraine, and even though President Biden reiterated his intention to continue supporting Ukraine in his meeting with Zelensky, the Ukrainian army would gladly take more shells instead of words of support. In this period, the US announced two military aid packages with a total value of $375 million, which included AIM-9M and AIM-7 missiles, HAM missiles, TAU missiles, Javelin and 84 anti-tank weapons, artillery shells, and so on. Several other countries pledged and delivered military aid to Ukraine as well. On December 2nd, Germany announced the delivery of four HX-81 tractors, eight Zetros off-road trucks, four other vehicles, 15 HLR-338 precision rifles, 60,000 rounds of ammunition, five drone detection systems, laser rangefinders, and 3,840 artillery shells. On the following day, the German arms producer Rheinmetall announced that it would deliver 40,000 rounds of 155mm artillery shells to Ukraine in 2024 and 142 million euros worth of shells in 2025. On December 8th, Germany pledged 1,750 155 mm shells, 70 GMW automatic grenade launchers, a Lunar NG drone, 10 Vector drones, 8 Zetros trucks and first aid kits, along with another Patriot air defense system pledged on a later date. On December 5th, Finland announced that it will start producing shells for Ukraine in the near future. The Japanese Prime Minister Kishida pledged $4.5 billion to Ukraine for humanitarian and financial needs. On December 11th, the IMF authorized payment of $900 million to Ukraine from its loan program, while Britain announced the transfer of two Sandown-class minehunters to the Ukrainian Navy. On December 13th, Norway stated it would transfer a NASAMS air defense system to Ukraine. And on December 14th, after Argentina got its new pro-Ukrainian president, the country pledged two civilian Mi-171E helicopters to Ukraine. According to the Kiel Institute for the World Economy, newly committed aid has reached a new low between August to October 2023, an almost 90% drop compared to the same period in 2022. Ukraine will need way more shells, air defense systems, drones, EW systems and long-range missiles, among other things, to create a balance on the battlefield and have a fighting chance to succeed. NATO chief Stoltenberg has already stated that the situation in Ukraine will get worse if the West does not increase arms deliveries. 
Meanwhile, Ukrainian sources report that Russia has ordered tens of thousands of FPV drones from different Chinese factories. It is difficult to assess this definitively, but based on the official figures, analysts estimate that Russia produces between 240 and 360 tanks per year, a figure which may reach 600 when Russia completes the construction of its new tank manufacturing facilities. In May, Ukrainian intelligence estimated that Russia produces up to 60 cruise missiles, 5 Iskander ballistic missiles, and 2 Kinjals monthly. Russia has also ramped up domestic drone production, as it manages to evade sanctions by buying components for its arms production from third countries. And they are still capable of financing their war by selling oil and gas. According to Bloomberg, Russia made $11.3 billion from the sale of crude oil and oil products in October 2023 alone, which is the highest oil revenue it has received since May 2022. In a televised interview, Putin stated that 617,000 Russian soldiers are currently stationed in Ukraine, with 244,000 of them called up last year during the mobilization, and the rest being sent to war after signing contracts with the Russian army. It is estimated that 20 to 40,000 sign such contracts every month. So while the Russian army suffers very heavy losses every time they go on the attack, often they eventually manage to overpower the Ukrainians through excessive use of artillery and manpower advantages. Putin is confident that he has sufficient military production and enough men to continue this strategy until he grinds out a victory in Ukraine. German Build, which doesn't necessarily have a stellar reputation but has been right at times before, claims that it has access to a secret Russian plan, outlining the escalation of the war in 2025 and 2026. In relatively good news for Ukraine, German Welt, which adheres to higher journalistic standards, reports that up to 95% of the hardware delivered to Ukraine in 2023 is operational and might be used in offensive and defensive operations in the future. Another piece of good news for Ukraine is that despite the Russian bombing of their port infrastructure and the fact that the Ukrainians managed to push the Russian fleet to the east side of the Black Sea, allowed Ukraine to continue shipping its products abroad. In 2023, the exports from Ukrainian ports grew to 52.8 million tons of cargo, an increase from 45.6 in 2022. Under current circumstances, Putin is unwilling to talk with Ukraine. He would only be ready to talk if Kyiv accepted the annexation of four oblasts and Crimea, and would presumably demand more. In his interview, he stated that the demand for denazification, whatever that means, still stands, which means that Russia still has the goal to topple the Ukrainian government. The crowd which demands that Ukraine stop fighting and negotiate with Russia must consider this if they genuinely want a just ending to the war, not a Russian victory. At this point, it looks like the American strategy is to encourage the Ukrainians to enter negotiations with Russia under favorable conditions. The first deputy assistant to the US President for National Security, Jonathan Feiner, said in his speech at the Aspen Security Forum, I think the place we would like to put the Ukrainians at the end of next year is where Russia is confronted with a decision. Either they have to come to the negotiating table on terms that would be acceptable to Ukraine, and based on the UN Charter's diktats of sovereignty and territorial integrity for Ukraine, or they will face a stronger Ukraine. But to reach this goal, the United States will need to increase supplies to Kyiv and encourage its allies to do the same. Ukraine has also received good news from Europe. On December 11th, the Polish government deblockaded the border crossings with Ukraine while on December 14th, the EU decided to start accession talks with Ukraine. It is an important boost of morale for Ukrainian society, but these talks may last a while. The war of attrition in Ukraine continues. As the attacking side, Russia is suffering more losses, but Putin is comfortable with this sacrifice, trusting that Russia's military production and internal stability will get him to the finish line, while Western support for Kyiv falters. U.S. intelligence claims that Russia has lost 87% of its pre-war ground forces, i.e. 315,000 men out of the 360,000 personnel. However, so far Russia has not experienced problems with a shortage of troops, as its crypto-mobilization efforts are sufficient to offset its losses. There is just not enough internal dissent with all the losses that Russia has suffered in this war, and there's no indication it may cause the disruption of Putin's unprovoked invasion of Ukraine. Now let's look at the visually confirmed losses compiled by the Oryx blog. As of December 16th, Russia has lost at least 2,541 tanks, 5,261 vehicles, 
260 command posts and communication stations, 1060 artillery systems and vehicles, 319 multiple rocket launchers, 95 aircraft, 133 helicopters, and 325 drones. Ukraine has lost at least 703 tanks, 2,194 vehicles, 18 command posts and communication stations, 451 artillery systems and vehicles, 53 multiple rocket launchers, 77 aircraft, 36 helicopters, and 235 drones. More episodes on this conflict are on the way, so make sure you are subscribed and press the bell button. Please consider liking, subscribing, commenting, and sharing. It helps immensely. Recently, we've started releasing weekly patron and YouTube member exclusive content. Consider joining their ranks via the link in the description or button under the video to watch these weekly videos, learn about our schedule, get early access to our videos, access our private Discord, and much more. This is the Kings and Generals channel, and we will catch you on the next one.